visit the Shanghai Tower. It's very, very, very tall. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, so okay, so this lecture I'm going to change a little bit. And now this lecture, I I wish I would have done this in the first hour today because this is going to get everybody thinking. About it. So what I want you to know, if you know nothing else from this lecture, I want you to know two things. I want you to know why I'm talking about what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> why I'm talking about relaxed consistency. And I want you to know the reason why it can be useful to relax read after right ordering. So right now you should not know what any of that means. Let me tell you. So not all of you are going to ever encounter what I'm about to talk about. But you will encounter it if you ever get a job writing operating systems, writing drivers for operating systems or if you really like programming ARM processors. <laughs> and many people program ARM processors these days because it's in every mobile device. So, so it's actually more useful than it may seem. So, okay. so the last two lectures I talked about memory coherence. Memory coherence says that when multiple processors are writing to the same memory address, we need to make memory behave as if caches did not exist. We want memory to behave as if the caches did not exist. Even though we're duplicating copies of that data, we never want to see a write followed by a read to that data where the read does not show the value of the write. So memory coherence is about making the memory system virtually look like caches aren't there. Memory consistency defines reads, the order of reads and writes to different variables. So remember in this demo when student 1 had x and student one set, uh, 2 had y, whenever student 1 did something to x, student 2 said, I don't care, I only have y. Now we're talking about sequences of operations that are writes to x and y, two different variables. So to say this again, just to be really clear, the goal of cache coherence is to make the computer appear as if the caches were not there. So if we did not have caches, you can ignore the last two lectures. This lecture is, applies even if you don't have caches. It's about uh, stores to different addresses. So remember from the first lecture, a program is just a list of instructions. And some of those instructions are loads and stores. So the program defines the order of loads and stores. Just within a single thread, a program defines the, uh, the list of, of, of loads and stores. Now, we said on the first lecture that within a single thread, if the program says load uh, store x and then says uh, store y, well it needs to execute those instructions in a manner that is consistent with the program order. Now superscalar execution, I remember ILP, said that wait a minute, if some of those instructions were independent, we could execute them in different orders, because it just didn't matter at all to the output, to the final output of the program, right? So I, superscalar execution says, I know you gave me the instructions in this order, but I'm going to do them in this other order because it's more efficient and I get the same answer. Right? Now we're going to talk about what happens if you make that assumption and you have multiple threads. Because it may seem like it won't matter, but it's going to matter a whole lot. Okay. So I'm listing here on this slide four different memory orders. So this says, write before read. Read before read. Read before write. Write before write. So in other words, this says, if a processor preserves this ordering, if a processor writes x and then writes y in a program, like the program says, write x, write y. If the write write ordering is preserved, write to x will commit, so all processors know what happens. 
before the right to lie. That, does that make sense? So that's why I talked about what does it mean for a right to commit. A right commit, remember, from 10 minutes ago, is when all processors are guaranteed, or, or when a processor is guaranteed to see the new value. So if I if I don't change right right ordering, that means that if a program has right to x and then right to y, that means that x will commit across the system before y commits. Now, this is a term that's very very important. A, cons a, a sequentially consistent system maintains all four of these orders. And in other words, what it means. Is, is very similar to coherence. It means that memory behaves exactly how you kind of intuitively want it to behave. Meaning that there's, regardless of all how many processors are running, all of the loads and stores can be put on a single timeline, and they look as if it is done serially or sequentially. Now notice here that in the last lecture I drew a timeline. The last lecture, the timeline was all loads and stores to the single variable x. Now there are loads and stores to different variables, x, y, maybe z. So a sequentially consistent memory system is equivalent to one that behaves like this. There is one memory, and the memory, even though all these threads are running in parallel, the memory just sequentially gives its attention to the different processors. So it says, okay, I will handle your load. Okay, I will handle your store. Okay, I will handle your load. So if the memory behaves like this, then it's very obvious what the timeline is, right? Because the memory is the timeline. One memory, tons of parallel processors, but only one memory request is serviced at a time. This is how we like to think about memory. We would like to say the processor did this, then this other processor did this, then this other processor did this. Okay. Now, so let's consider two programs. So this lecture will have a lot of programs. And hopefully you're sitting by your friends. I want you to talk through a lot of this with other students. This will be very interactive. So imagine I have thread one. And thread one says I will store one to A. And then if B is zero, I will print hello. And thread two says I will store one to B. And if thread, if, sorry, if the value of A is zero, I will print world. So I want you to talk with your friends and I want you to tell me what are possible outputs of this program. Because remember, these are two parallel threads. So thread one could run completely first and then thread two. Thread 2 could run and then thread 1, or it could be any like interleaving of any of these instructions. So just assume that so B equals 1 is a store, if A equals 0 is a load, and then print is whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay? So talk it over for one minute, and I want to know what possible values can get printed. Okay? So one minute.
Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. So can someone tell me how this program can print hello and only hello? What is an ordering of the operations for it to print only hello? So remember, these are two threads. They're running instructions completely in parallel. So what, how, do we, how do I order the instructions so that the program only prints hello? OK, so thread one. So this happens first. Yeah. Then the if check, right? And then, OK, so that has, b equals 1 has not happened. Oh, sorry. b equals 1 has not happened, so this is true. And so we print hello. And then let's say that b equals 1. What happens here? False. And we will never print more. Correct. Now, what is a sequence of instructions where I only print world? The exact opposite. So this thread happens first. Um, and so a one, two, three. Also notice it would be fine if this was three. No problem, right? Four, five. Just I want to point out that that's also perfectly valid, right? This can happen, this can happen, this is true. So we will run this instruction. But before that instruction runs, we might set A equals one, check here. So what will happen here? It will be false because B is 1. And so on and so on. Oh, this, this should not be there. <laughs> right. OK. So is there a sequence of instructions where the program prints hello world? The order is reversed. The order is reversed. What do you mean? Uh, because the, the variable is not volatile, so maybe the order uh, may, may reverse. So uh, we, uh, first we can execute if, and then... Okay, right. So, so now remember uh, that the... Uh, but, but, okay, but right now, I want you to... Yeah, so, so, so something would have to be different about how the program runs uh, in order for uh, uh, this program to print Hello World. We all agree, right? Because if this instruction happens after this instruction, then that's not possible, right? Because if b is 0, we are guaranteed for a equals 1, and that must mean that we won't print world. Or if a is 0, we're guaranteed b equals 1, and so on and so on. Correct. So, but if this is a normal sequentially consistent program, meaning that everything happens in order, you can print hello, or you can print world, but you cannot print hello world. Right. And so I gave you know a number of different uh, answers. Uh, it also you can also print. Oh, we didn't go. How can you print um, nothing? It's also possible to print nothing, right? Um, which would be maybe one, two, three. Four, right? So it's also possible to print nothing. So if this is, you know, if we're trying to think of well, what order did things happen? Well, I gave you four possible orderings here, and you came up with all of these. Now, notice that if you look at any one thread, you know, a equals one is a completely independent instruction from if b equals zero. So a superscalar processor, if it wanted to do all these fancy things, and it was only thinking about executing one thread correctly, could reorder those instructions. Right? And if it, but if it reordered one of those instructions, it definitely would relax one of these orderings. Right? In this case, it is a read after a write ordering, because the write is the a equals 1. Sorry read after write. Write is a equals 1, and then the if b equals 0 is the read. So if we want to do all the fancy things that we normally do to run a thread well, 
Well, then we could create some very unexpected behavior in a multi-threaded program. Because remember, or reordering these instructions, this thread still behaves exactly as it, was, as it would if they were not reordered. But now, reordering those instructions can sort of make for some interesting effects when we're thinking about a multi-threaded program. So, if we think about memory as always just running you know, the instructions in program order, that's another way to think about uh, memory, uh, what sequentially consistent means. So let's go back to this example. Um, and that's what I said, from the processor's perspective, from any one processor, these are independent instructions. But, um, and so they could be reordered. So, in general, it makes a lot of sense to allow independent instructions to be reordered. Like, for example, imagine if we had write A and then read B, which was exactly what our program was. It seems silly to wait until the write is completely committed, completely done, before we read B. We should maybe, while the write is going on, we should just immediately start reading B. But that, you know, like, but, but we can get into some trouble. So another way of thinking about relaxed orderings is that there are a set of dependencies in the program that are uh, ordered. There's an, the, the program defines a set of dependencies that absolutely must be respected. Like in this example, write some values and then unlock. Imagine this was the update and then we wanted to unlock. And then another processor took the lock and read the value. Now, the program says that every single instruction comes after each other. So that's why I drew the dependencies this way. But the actual dependencies look more like this. We just need to make sure that both A equals 1 and B equals 1 are written to, we don't care in what order, before the lock is unlocked. And we need to make sure that the lock is locked <laughs> before A and B are read. Again, we don't care what order it is. So relaxed consistency memory allows the processor to reorder operations so they can run faster without ever violating a single thread's dependencies. We can never do that. So I want to talk about the most common reordering, which is reordering reads after writes. So this is a read to B after a write to A. And the major reason why we do this is that we would like to read A so the processor can keep going while the write is still going out to map. And there's some examples of schemes that allow this. Um, so the simplest way that a processor implements this reordering is, is that whenever it needs to perform a write, it sticks the write in a write buffer. Like it says, oh, I need to do a, this is like the simplest superscalar processor. <laughs> is I need to do a write and the next read is independent. Well, I need to read the value so I can keep going, so how about I just read the value first, and I'll put the write off to the side, and I'll do it later. That's the write buffer. Okay, so a common optimization, every processor will do this, is the write buffer. And if you look at this chart, these are three different applications. This is the performance, or this is the execution time. And the execution time is broken down into time spent on write instructions, time spent on read instructions, and time spent doing other stuff. And if you notice the difference between a system with full, the baseline, full memory consistency, sequential consistency, versus a system that relaxes read after write ordering, what is the difference between the two bars? It's the gray part. Notice that the writes, the cost of the writes has just disappeared because this is a, uh, an out-of-order processor, and whenever it's doing reads, it's doing writes down in the background. So this is a reasonable optimization to want to do. So there are many different types of memory systems that relax the requirement that a write has to commit completely before any reads can happen. And the names of these things are, uh, are here. So the first one, it's called TSO, Total Store Ordering. And this is really, this is close to what a modern x86 chip does. Very close. Is that a processor B 
can read um, can read B. So a processor can start reading B before its earlier write to A has committed. So I can start executing the next instruction before all the other processors know that I've done the write. But all of the other processors get word, get, get notification of the write at the same time. So if we would need three processors to show this off. We need an example of three students here. So it would basically be like if I say, I am going to write, all the other processors hear that message at the same time. And PC, processor consistency, is another form of relaxed consistency that does not provide exactly the same guarantee. It says that one thread can, uh, can do a read before an earlier write is done, but news of that write gets to all the other processors at different times. So this would be an example, like you can think about a directory where I say, I'm going to write. So I go tell processor 1, hey, I'm going to write. And then later I go tell processor 2, hey, I'm going to write. So in the first example, all the processors get news of the write at the same time. It can be late, but news at the same time. In the second example, they get used maybe at different times. But in both cases, the processor that's saying, I'm going to write, can start doing a read before it is finished <coughs> talking to all of the other people. Okay. So now here's where it's going to get interesting. So I have four programs on this slide. And I have both these relaxed consistency models. And I want you to tell me are the results of execution the same as if we did not relax memory at all? Or in other words, are they the same as if this was a fully sequentially consistent program? So first of all, you should figure out what will the program do if nothing was ever reordered? That's the first step. And then you should think through what can, what can happen if I allow a read to move up in front of a write. Okay, so let's try that for program one. Why don't you go talk about it a little bit? So, do you think that the relaxed <coughs> consistency models are the same as the fully unordered model? And again, keep in mind that relaxed here means the only thing we can reorder is if there's a write and then a read the read can come up in front of the right. If there's a right and then a right, no reordering can happen. Okay? So talk over that for one minute. Problem one only. If we go with a relaxed consistency model that reorders reads after writes, will you get the same answer? Okay, talk about that for one second. It's not clear. Think about print A as reading A. Right, that's a read. Okay. Okay. So this one's a little simpler. So I, uh, let's move quickly on this one. And we'll, we'll the other ones get more complex. So, what in a normal no reordering, what does program one print? What is, what is the what is the output of this program? I'm sure you know. 
I'm sure you know. It's one. And why is it one? But because a equals one. But when does this program print a? This program prints a if flag is one. And if flag is one, this instruction must have been executed. And if this instruction must have been executed, then this instruction must have been executed. So in other words, I can talk about this as there's a equals one, which depends on, uh, which comes before flag equals one. Oops. So if flag equals one, then clearly a equals one. And here, if flag if flag equals one, that means that this must have happened. And if this must have happened, print a definitely comes after a equals one. So we're going to print one. Now imagine that I can move a read in front of a write. Does anything change? People are you, so you're saying no, you're saying no. Does anybody think that anything changes? So in this example, that's absolutely correct. Nothing changes, right? Because the only thing that we can reorder is we can order, reorder a read after a write by the same process. And so if, but we never reorder writes. So we're guaranteed that if this write commits, so if a, if a processor observes that flag equals one, well, they would have also already observed the commit of A equals one. So because the, pro the system does not reorder writes, this program will behave exactly like a fully ordered program. So what, you know, the reordering just does not even come into play. Yet. So what about program two, though? It may be the same again. So it's a valid answer. So now, this is program, okay, yeah. So I want you to think about it a little bit. So what are the, the possible values? That's the first thing we should think about. What are the possible values? So, so you can talk over it for, talk for one, think about it for one minute. What are the possible values that we can be pr uh, printed? And if I relax reads after writes, will that change? Okay, go for it. So can someone tell me one valid output of the sequentially consistent version of the program? There are three possible answers. So what is one possible answer? So can the program print 0, 0? Okay. How does the program, what is a, an order of operations that allows the program to print 0, 0? Right, it could be print A, then print B, and 
then it's um, so what? Oh, it's from B, yes, sorry. From B, from A, A equals 1, B equals 1, right? So remember, sequentially consistent is like a memory system going, I will handle you, and then you, and then you. And so here the memory system says, I will handle load B, then I'll handle load A, then I'll handle store A, then I'll handle store B. So this print zero, 00. What, are some, what is another option on what can be printed? 1, 1. So that one makes sense too because let's just say that A equals 1, B equals 1 happens first, and then print and print. Absolutely. So we can print 0, 0. We can print 1, 0. And there's one more option that we can't we can, is, that can be printed. What is that? What is that? Zero, 1. OK. So 0, 1. So what's the order that needs to happen for that? Print. Uh, 0, 1, right? So it can be print B. A equals 1. Print A. B equals 1. Correct. This would print 0, 1. So how can you, or how can you, print 1, 0? You cannot print 1, 0 in a sequentially consistent memory system. Because if we print 1, right, so if, we, if, if B is 1, if we print 1, that means that this has happened. And we can't reorder, or well, not reorder anything, so that means A equals 1 must have happened. Therefore, when we print A, we will also print 1. So I cannot print 1, 0. Now, can I print 1, 0 if I reorder any reads after rest? And again, what you should be thinking is, I know I can't reorder writes. Notice that there are no reads after writes in this program. Again, right? So this thread writes twice, this thread reads twice. None of those operations can be reordered. The only thing that we can reorder is a read after write. So again, things are completely the same. Okay, so I want to give you two examples of things that are absolutely the same. And I can tell you that in the coming uh, uh, examples, things will get different. So now I want you to tell me what happens in this program. So first of all, think about what happens in sequentially consistent. Then think about what happens in total store ordering. Total store ordering allows a read, sorry, a write, to, uh, to get moved up after a read. Sorry, a read to get moved up in front of a write. And um, so in, piece, it's in TSO, when this happens, whenever thread 2, as soon as thread 2 knows that A equals 1, we're guaranteed that thread 3 also knows. In PC ordering, thread 2 can hear that A equals 1, and it may be a while before thread 3 hears A equals 1. Okay. So think about that a little bit. Okay? So go ahead and think of it. So I want to know should I put check boxes here or X's here in my chart? Okay, this is a little bit trickier, so why don't you think about that?
Okay. So let's let's try. So so let's first talk about what happens in the normal in a normal no order. So a equals one. How do we get to print A? Well, we can't print A until B is 1. When does B get set to 1? Well, B only gets set to 1 if A is not 0. And A gets not, is not 0 here. So what will happen is, if whenever we print A, A must have happened, which caused us to fall through this loop, which caused us to write 1, which caused us to read 1, which caused us to finally print 1. Okay. So what do you think happens in the first system here? So a write happens. At some point in the future, thread 2 sees the write command. Agree? A becomes 1 here. And also, we're guaranteed that if A becomes 1 here, like thread 1 shouted out, I'm going to write A. And thread 2 and 3 said, OK, we understand. We are dropping the line. So thread 2, if thread 2 reads the new value, thread 3 will also read the new value. So if thread 3 read A right at the exact same time, it would be 1. But now thread 2 sets 1, B equals 1. At some point later, that gets to thread 3. And at this point, we know that it is 1. It is 1. OK. So in this case, again, nothing has changed, because notice that no thread performs a write and then a read. So there's still there's nothing to reorder yet. Now, things can get a little tricky now in this example. Let's think about what happens. Red 1 writes A. The message about the write is going to processor 2 now. And then another message about the write is going to processor 3. Think about it it's like a directory. So imagine that processor 2 sees, ah, A changed. A is now 1. I will write B equals 1. So I'm going to send a message back to processor 1 and processor 3 that I've written B. If for some reason this message gets to this processor first, now all of a sudden this processor says, oh, well, B is 1. But they haven't heard that A is 1 yet. So they could actually print 0, a valid program, like a processor that implements PC memory consistency can print 0 here. Right? And so notice that we cannot put the order of operations on the timeline, right? Because thread processor 2 thinks that it was store A, load A, store B. That's what processor 2 thinks. Processor 3 thinks it was uh, store B, load B, store A. Because processor 2 gets this message and then gets that message. So these two processors disagree on what order the operations came from or, or happened in. So memory is not behaving like a single timeline. One processor thinks there was one timeline. Another processor thinks there was a different timeline. It is not equal to sequential consistency. So this is a good example of how to think about the timeline. If it's sequentially consistent, there is one timeline that everybody agrees with. And in this example, I created a situation where, given these rules, the processors will not agree on a timeline. So let's think about the last program now to talk about that. And so this is actually very similar to the first problem that I gave you a while ago. It was print hello world. So tell me what can happen now, given that a read can happen on this processor before this write is visible to all the other processors. 
So just to be very clear, I don't want you to think about it as thread one th will print B before it would ever print A equals one. Right. So from thread one's perspective, the instructions always occur in this order. We are talking about reordering of these instructions as viewed by another processor. Okay. So here, print, print B can happen on this processor before the write A equals 1 commits at all other processors. That's what I mean by read after write reorder. So tell me what can happen here. So take a minute and talk about it. You guys were having a good discussion last time. I will ask you the question. So you better have another good discussion this time. <laughs> the question is coming your way. <laughs> guarantees that all memory operations above it 
are done before this returns. So you have to manually add uh, uh, instructions to the instruction stream. So x86 has something like lfence and sfence and mfence. So like lfence says all loads before this instruction are guaranteed to be done before this instruction arrives. And uh, S fence is a store fence. It says all stores before this instruction are guaranteed to be committed. Uh, all other processors will see them before we get going. Um, and so a lot of this stuff you don't have to worry about too much. Because for example in C++ these days, if you just wrap a variable with a tonic, the compiler guarantees that it will emit the appropriate instructions so that you get sequentially consistent semantics, even if the hardware is not. So the hardware will say, oh, I will insert a fence before here or before here. So it turns out that it's kind of nice that since uh, x86 gives you a lot of guarantees, the compiler usually doesn't insert any fences. And if you actually took the, uh, the exact same code on ARM, it would insert a bunch of fences. Um, so I'll stop there. I don't want to take too much of your time. I think that, uh, yeah, that's the summary. Is the thing I want you to know is that if we want to run single-threaded uh, code fast, we have to reorder things. That's just what processors do. A processor will never reorder instructions in a manner that changes that thread of control's output. Otherwise, the, pro the processor would just be broken. This is super scalar execution. But if you change the order of independent instructions, Sometimes in a parallel program, you might create situations that seem a little weird. And this is code that we would all write all the time and expect it to work. And on some computers, it's not going to work because of memory reorder. Okay. So for those of you that are writing low-level code, drivers and things like that, you will see these problems. Uh, if you go work at NVIDIA in the driver group, you will, you will deal with this issue. If you go work for uh, uh, a company that's working on Linux or something like that, you will see these issues. Um, if you're writing application level code, you're going to use C++ atomics or locks or barriers and everything will be fine. <laughs> the, the library will do it for you. Okay, I'll talk to you tomorrow.